Nancy, we'll begin our program with voting rights. Pam will explain to you who is ed eligible to vote in a Michigan election. Okay, so the beginning of our program this evening, uh, we're going to be taking a look at election laws in Michigan, and then we're going to get into attempts that are underway right now to change some of those laws. And this is such an important topic because election laws are the foundation of our democracy. So the first step to becoming a voter in our great state of Michigan is to get registered. Current election law requires a person to show proof of their Michigan residency. You also have to be a US citizen. You must be at least 18 years old and not serving a jail sentence in order to vote. Now there's several methods <clears throat> that you can use to register to vote. You can register in person at your local clerk's office or at any Michigan Secretary of State's office. Voters can also register online or by mail if they have a state issued ID or a state issued driver's license. Certain state agencies also allow uh, people to register with them uh, in a paper uh, form. But no matter which method of registration you choose, whether it's online or in person or in mail, you have to prove that you are in fact a Michigan resident. There's several allowable documents that you can use to take care of this. And uh, those are listed on your screen on our slide. And in addition, you're required to sign your registration form, attesting to the truthfulness and the accuracy of the information that you provided. Your signature, your handwritten signature is very important because it provides a unique way of identifying yourself in all future elections. So Pam, how can a registered voter vote early? Any registered voter in Michigan is eligible to vote ahead of the actual election day. And this is called AV voting or absentee voting, and it can happen by mail or in person. Both mail and in-person early voting require that you fill out and submit a written application. And this application must include your handwritten signature. So these applications have to be filled out and signed every time you wanna vote AV uh, in order to use this absent voter ballot process. You fill it out and sign it for each individual election. The process can begin up to 40 days before an election because this is when clerks receive their supply of their printed ballots. All absent voter ballots have to be returned to the precinct uh, in their sealed envelopes by the day of the election. If you're in the military or you are living overseas and you're a registered voter, you are also eligible to use this AV process. So this whole absent voting process or early voting process can be done, as was mentioned, by mail, by using a secure drop box if it's available, or in person, or a combination of these methods. For example, you might get your ballot by mail and drop it off in person, or you might pick up your ballot in person, drop it in a drop box. Uh, voters should contact the clerk in their assigned precinct to find out the specifics of these options. Before using this absent voter or early voter process, you have to be registered. And if you're not sure if you are registered, it's very easy to check um, online. You can check your registration status and find out also your precinct location. And you can find out your local clerk's contact information. It's all online. There's the website on our screen, michigan.gov slash vote. Great. Could you tell us a bit more about what a voter can expect on election day? Okay, let's start by saying that if you are a registered voter and you've registered ahead of time, you go to your assigned precinct, you'll fill out an application in the precinct. That's that little, that small square piece of paper. You show your ID, the election inspector will check your information and find your name on the precinct list. You get your numbered ballot, you mark the ballot, you run it through the optical scan machine, and you have voted in person. Most voters who 
come in to vote in a precinct are already registered ahead of time and therefore their name will appear on that printed precinct list. If you happen to come into a precinct in your jurisdiction and you're not registered, let's say you recently moved, it's now possible under Michigan law, as of 2018, when Proposition 3 was passed, to vote the same day of an election. This is called same day registration. It can only happen at your local clerk's office and you have to have proper documentation to do this. I wanna emphasize that only the clerk in your voting precinct can register, your, register you that day. For example, you can't go to a secretary of state's office on election day and register and vote the same day. You have to be at your local clerk's office. In-person voting in Michigan, all precincts are required to be open from seven in the morning until eight at night. And you will be asked to show an ID when you come in to vote in person. If your name is on your precinct list, you're in the right place, you are a registered voter, but for some reason you forgot your ID or it's not in your purse that day or your pocket. Current law allows you to sign an affidavit. It's on the back of that little registration slip that I mentioned, or that um, application slip. You sign that affidavit attesting to your identity. You affirm that you filled out the form truthfully and that you are who you say you are. And all of this is under penalty of perjury. And then if you sign the affidavit, you can be issued a regular ballot, fill it out, goes through the scan machine and you have voted. And just as a note, the vast majority of Michigan voters in Michigan bring an ID and show it. In the 2020 election, this past general presidential election, there was a very small fraction of voters who used that affidavit process. It was two tenths of 1% two-tenths of one percent of all voters in Michigan use that affidavit process. If you were issued an absent ballot ahead of election day, it has to be returned either by mail, in person, or put in a drop box by eight o'clock on election day in order to be counted. So this Proposition 3 that was mentioned, it was passed in 2018, um, may have affected the next general election. And Sandy's gonna help us by looking at three slides comparing 2016 to 2020. Thank you. Like Pam said, in 2018, Michigan voters passed Proposition 3, which was also known as Promote the Vote. And it, it expanded our voting rights Possibly as a result of that, more people voted in 2020 than in 2016, in spite of COVID. The five and a half million voters who turned out in 2020 represent 71% of the registered voters in the state. The 4.9 million voters from 2016 represent 63% of qualified voters. The next slide shows us about absentee ballot voting. So in 2016, 1.3 million voters chose to use the absentee ballot. In 2020, 3.3 million voters used the absent ballot option. That represents nearly two thirds of all the votes that came in and were counted were absentee ballots. So now we'll look a little closer at the, uh, do a recap of the presidential election on the next slide. So in 2016 and 2020, we had fairly close presidential elections. In 2016, Donald Trump won by about 11,000 votes. In the 2020 election, President Biden won by 155,000 votes. We had a closer election in 2016, but there was no drawn out campaign 
claiming voter fraud. After the 2020 election, there were multiple audits, court cases, and a report by the Republican-led Senate Oversight Committee, which affirmed that the election was fair and secure. Post-election audits were the most extensive in Michigan history. Pam is going to tell us a little bit more about the audit process. Well, <clears throat> it might be repeating, and we all know and have heard about the great deal of controversy over this last presidential election that happened in 2020. People claim that the election was rigged. Uh, we heard that it was stolen. We heard that it wasn't fair. And there were numerous court cases filed in our great state of Michigan, all of which found no evidence of widespread voter fraud. I just want to do a quick overview of how elections are administered. In our state, the running of elections is a responsibility that's held by Michigan elected township clerks and city clerks. There are just over 1,500 of these local clerks. They oversee the administration of elections in their own particular jurisdictions. Every step of an election process um, is covered by the election laws in Michigan, whether it's ordering ballots, issuing absentee ballots, testing voting machines, hiring election inspectors, processing people who come in to vote on the day of the election or reporting results. All of these steps are covered in detail and must be followed by every um, local clerk who oversees an election. And each of these steps and many more requires specific documentation. So this is what makes elections reviewable and auditable by county and state officials. For example, just one small part of the process of um, administering an election in a, in a precinct. A clerk receives a set of ballots for a specific election. Every one of those ballots is numbered, starting with number one and going through however many ballots there are in that set. And whether those ballots are used for early voting, sent out as absentees, whether they're marked and tabulated in a precinct by voters who come in on election day, or whether they're left over because there always are you know, you never want to run out, so there always are some unused ballots. Every one of those ballots, used and unused, is required by Michigan election law to be accounted for. These uh, ballots are sealed in approved ballot containers, and as I said, every ballot must be accounted for. And all of these steps are carried out and documented in, in every precinct in Michigan. After the 2020 election, however, there were an unprecedented number of claims of fraud and a number of audits took place. I'm gonna just look briefly at three types of audits that took place um, last fall. The first one, our first example, county clerks reviewed procedures in precincts in more than 200 in-person voting precincts. This type of audit, reviews procedures and verifies that officials, the clerks and their staff, and poll workers followed the legally required procedures. It also ensured that pre-election requirements were fulfilled and that all the required records were maintained. In our second example of uh, audits in Michigan, there were four large jurisdictions that had what we call absent voter counting boards. Now an absent voter counting board is established to process absent ballots by a trained group of election inspectors. And this process happens separate from the in-person voters who are coming in on election day. During these audits, the Michigan Bureau of Election worked with city and county officials to review records and procedures of the absent, these four absent voting counting boards. In a third example of audits, this was one that was conducted throughout the state, providing yet another basis for voter confidence. 1,300 Michigan clerks were involved in selecting sample ballots from their sealed 
um, set of ballots and it amounted to some 18,000 ballots. Uh, those votes were counted and that count was used for a statistical comparison to the statewide totals. And finally, something that's not on our slide, the Michigan Bureau of Elections conducted a full hand count of the presidential results up in Antrim County. That's in Northern Michigan. Many of you might remember that because it was the focus of national attention for a while. Um, I went to michigan.gov uh, to find out more about that particular audit. And I read it, I didn't read the whole thing, but there's a 54 page report resulting from that audit that showed some examples of human error and uh, no uh, intentional uh, widespread voter fraud. In spite of the results of all these court cases and audits that provided no ev evidence of voter fraud, the Michigan legislature has begun the process of trying to change some of Michigan's election laws. So this next part of our program is going to tell about some of those efforts. And Sandy's going to start out by telling us some things that are happening. Thanks. The reaction to the 2020 election has resulted in over 100 bills being introduced into the Michigan House of Representatives. On the screen, you can see just a few examples of the content of some of those bills. In the Senate, a 39 bill package was introduced in March of 2021, as well as another 60 bills, all designed to change election laws. Maybe it'd be helpful if we go to our next slide and Sandy just looks at an overview of the process of such bills going into going through the process. Sure. Here's a quick overview of the legislative process. So a bill starts in the Senate Elections Committee, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that Senate Elections Committee in just a moment. Once it goes through that committee, it goes on to the Senate, and from there, if they pass it, it goes to the House Elections and Ethics Committee. After that, it goes back to the Senate, and then the Senate sends it to the governor. The governor has the option of signing or vetoing the bill. If she vetoes it, legislators can try to override the veto by a two-thirds vote. So currently in the Senate, there are 38 members. 22 of those senators are Republicans. 16 are Democrats. It would take 24 of their votes to override a veto. In the House of Representatives, there are 110 members, 55 are Republicans, 51 are Democrats, and there are four vacancies. It would take 71 of their votes to override the veto. So the next slide uh, will give Sandy a chance to give us those details about the Michigan Senate Election Committee that was in, that we just saw on our slide. Okay, the Senate Elections Committee is a four-member group made up of the chair, Ruth Johnson, who is our former Secretary of State. She's a Republican from Oakland County. Ed McBroom is a Republican from the Upper Peninsula. Curtis Vanderwall represents Senate District 35, which includes Manistee County. And the lone Democrat is Paul Wojno. He's from Macomb County. The committee began hearing testimony in April and the hearings are continuing. They've taken testimony on all 39 bills in the package. Most of the bills are still in committee. However, 12 of them have moved on and some of them have made it as far as the governor's desk. Um, the next slide shows us quickly where you can go for more information. I think it was maybe oh, at the it was bottom, at the bottom of the other one. I'm sorry. Slide. If you'd like any information on any of those bills, you can always go to the league website. It's lwvmi.org. Okay, next, Pam is going to tell us about some of the bills that made it as far as the governor's desk. 
Well, as Sandy mentioned, some bills in the selection package were sent to Governor Whitmer. There were four House bills and four Senate bills. This happened last fall. <clears throat> the governor vetoed these eight bills and she sent a letter to Capitol Hill detailing her reasons for not supporting the passage of those bills. I went online, michigan.gov, found a copy of the letter. It's very easy to do. These are some of the topics that those vetoed bills uh, dealt with. In Governor Whitmer's letter, she said that the bills perpetuated the big lie that the presidential election was stolen and fraudulent. In her letter, she also stated that the legislation restricted voter, attempted to restrict voter rights and that some of these bills contain legislation that was already in current Michigan law. So on your screen, you can see the topics of these bills. And these are complex, the, the hearings, the process and also how can people find out more, Sandy, about specific bills, where they are, it's mm -hmm. constantly changing and updating. You can get a complete copy of the list of bills, the current status of each bill, and the League of Women Voters positions on those bills by going to the League website, lwvmi.org. You can also look up minutes and testimony by going to senate.michigan.gov and select Senate Elections Committee or you can check the house.michigan.gov website and select the House Elections and Ethics Committee. You can also look up each bill and see an analysis of it at michigan.legislature.gov. So Pam, are there any other efforts to make sure that voting rights are secure? Well, I want to mention um, our Secretary of State's legislative agenda. Um, our current Secretary of State, who is Jocelyn Benson, has proposed an agenda um, of legislation that she re is recommending, but none of this has been acted upon yet by our senators and representatives. I just want to look at three main goals of her legislative agenda. She wants uh, new legislation to ensure equitable access for all Michigan voters. One of the, her specific suggestions is that last bullet point there that would make election day a state holiday. Her second big goal is to strengthen the infrastructure of voting. This is the way that elections are administered. Um, one highlight here is that fourth bullet point, it would, Right now in Michigan, there can be a May and an August election. Her suggestion is to combine those two and have a June election. And in a general election year, that would mean that the primary would be held in June, giving more time between the primary and the November general. Her third big uh, goal is to make voting even more safe and secure one specific suggestion is that there be a law prohibiting open carry of firearms within 100 feet of a voting location. So now we've, we've talked about how elections work, a little bit about some proposed changes, but there's another way besides that legislative process that Sandy explained to change election laws in Michigan. And there is an effort underway to impact election laws um, it's called the Initiative Petition, and so Sandy can tell us about that. Sure, thanks. There's a new initiative petition called Secure My Vote. The petitions are being circulated now, and they seem to be a response to the 2020 election and the belief by some that there was voter fraud. So in September, this ballot question committee group called Secure My Vote submitted an initiative petition to the State Board of Canvassers. The board approved the form and the summary of their petitions, which are now being circulated. They have to gather over 340,000 valid signatures. The number is equivalent to 8% of the voters who voted for the governor in 2018. This process is used to enact a law that the governor cannot veto 
Once the signatures are verified by the Board of Canvassers, the legislature can vote to enact the law or put it on the next general election ballot as long as it doesn't have an appropriation or money associated with it. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. And uh, one, one more thing. Um, the Secure My Vote Ballot Question Committee is required, all, all of the ballot committees are required to file a financial report. So this group filed their report in November, and at that time they had $85,000. But 80,000 of it, the bulk of it came from one single donor. You can find out all the details of this by going to the Michigan Campaign Finance Statement Detail. And it shows nictusa.com on your screen. So on our next slide, Sandy's going to walk us through the steps of this initiative petition. Right. So citizens of Michigan may initiate ballot petitions to do one of three things. The first thing would be to amend the Constitution. The second would be to write new law or change existing law, which is what Secure My Vote does. The third thing is the referendum. A referendum by definition is when voters decide if law that has been passed by the legislature should go into effect or not. So valid, um, oh, once the signatures are validated by the Board of Canvassers, then the petition goes directly to the legislature and they have 40 days to adopt it. If they do adopt it, it becomes law in 90 days. Normally, this 90 day period would be when the citizens have a chance to enact the referendum. But because this particular initiative has an appropriation, has money assigned to it, it cannot be go through the referendum process. And so, um, and it wouldn't be placed on the ballot. A citizen initiated proposal also may not be vetoed by the governor. So in, Wait, just a second, just a second. I'm sorry. A citizen initiated law can be amended by the legislature after it's adopted, but then if it if they amended it, it would return to the regular legislative process, which is subject to the governor's veto. So that's not going to apply in this case. If the appropriation, the government funds associated, if it has an appropriation, then there can be no referendum. Secure My Vote has an appropriation and there can be no referendum. So, so there's a lot of details, uh, things that are in this Secure My Vote. Maybe you could help us look at those in our next couple of slides. Sure. Secure My Vote does not amend the Constitution or allow for a referendum. It would alter existing laws and create a few new ones. On the screen, you'll be able to take a look at some of those. Um, Secure My Vote would mandate that the people disclose partial social security numbers when registering to vote. It would restrict options for verifying identity. If you have no identity, the voter must use the provisional ballot and would have to go back to the clerk's office within six days to verify their identity. It would eliminate the use of the affidavit. It would require on absentee ballots that you disclose driver's license or state ID or social security number. No absentee ballot applications could be mailed unless specifically requested. It would ban charitable contributions, volunteer time, and donated space. It would establish a voter access fund, and this is the appropriation. It's $3 million for one year to help cover the cost of identification for those who need it. So currently in Michigan, the cost of getting a government, a Michigan state ID. state ID is about $10. Um, and finally, it allows the legislature to adopt law without a vote of the people and without a governor veto. Are, are other states 
uh, trying to make changes or making changes in election laws? Yes, across the United States, 19 states have passed 34 bills that change voting laws. And you can see those states on the screen, they're highlighted in blue. And what about uh, the legislative response in Washington, D.C. regarding election law? Well, at the federal level, there are three acts. Um, and they're doing okay in the House of Representatives, but they seem to get stuck in the Senate. The three acts are the For the People Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and the Freedom to Vote Act. And they seem to be in doom, so I'm not going to go into a lot very more currently in the news of what's happening in the Senate with this um, voting with voting rights mm -hmm. acts. So how can people get more information and stay up to date with all of this legislation? Well, okay, once again, the league website lwv.org has a wealth of information. You can go to the Secretary of State's fact check site at michigan.gov. And this takes us to our final topic, which is fake news. <laughs> so Pam's going to tell us about fake news. Let's start out. Everybody's probably heard the term fake news. Um, we're going to talk about false information in two categories. We're going to call it misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is sharing false information without the intent of causing harm. Um, you know, you can be misinformed about something. It can happen in journalism too. A, a journalist may misinterpret something and, and print it or, or pass it on. Um, it happens a lot on social media. Well-intentioned individuals can share a post or click that like button without realizing that the information is outdated or misleading. And this is an unintentional way to spread false information, but without the intention of causing harm. On the other hand, disinformation is creating and sharing false information where there is an intention to cause harm. For example, um, ulterior motive like promoting a lie or political gain. And unscrupulous persons who spread disinformation online have a motive behind it. Could be to promote voter suppression. It could be to increase mistrust or so distrust in our democracy. But the common goal in social media, this disinformation is to have their bad or false information reach the mainstream media by repeating it again and again. How can you get better at spotting fake news? Well, so many of us are online now and we get our news online through email or social media. And there are some specific things we can do to spot disinformation. First, we can consider the source. If you're on a website, look at the URL. Does that address look strange? Is it misspelled in some way? If you're on a website, you can click the about page uh, on the website, find out through Google who's running that page, who's running that website. A second thing that you can do is check the date of the information. Is this really old news? Um, not that long ago, I saw a post, it was a quote from a current states person, and I fact checked it and found out that in fact, it was a quote by this person, but it had been made 15 years ago in a completely different context. And it was being like recirculated now, and it was out of date, and uh, I considered it disinformation. Third thing that you can do before you believe a post or before you repost something is to try to cross check the information. Do you see this story being reported by reputable news sources anywhere else? As I said, fact check websites are easy to use and readily available. Fourth thing we can do is to read past the headline. 
I mean, who hasn't been in a grocery store checkout line and seen some outrageously provocative headline? You know that's not the whole story. So ask yourself, what is the whole story? Be skeptical. Is the headline telling the entire story? And a final tip is to be aware of emotionally charged content. When you see an image or a meme that is designed to spark anger, make you fearful, uh, promote outrage, or make you sad or worried, question it. Uh, disinformation often uses an emotionally charged message in an attempt to, sh to sow division. And so for our final uh, PowerPoint slide of the evening, Sandy's going to tell us what are some things we can do to combat misinformation and disinformation. Yes. First of all, never quote the bad information. This only helps to spread the bad message wider Studies show that repeating bad information, even to debunk it, makes people more likely to remember the bad information and not the good. Refer to the bad information without quoting it. For example, you could say, false claims about the legitimacy of the 2020 election have been made, rather than saying, Representative XYZ says that thousands of ballots were being stuffed into ballot boxes. This isn't true. Well, when you do that, the image that sticks in everyone's mind is of the ballot boxes being stuffed. So try and focus on providing the correct information and if possible, include trustworthy sources where people can go to learn more information. It cannot be said enough. Do, Do not, not repeat, repeat or quote bad information. information. And this concludes our presentation. So we'll move now to the question and answer portion, and I'll turn the program over to Michelle.